States. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Alex. And I'm so happy to be here today and share um, this um, talk with you. Um, and as, as Alex was saying, it's really, it's all about interconnectedness and flourishing and how those two things interrelate. And that's what we'll be um, kind of going through today. Well, as you can see, what I'll be talking about today is um, the web of meaning, which we'll understand um, as we roll out what that means and how recognizing our interconnectedness lays the path to full flourishing. And well, I'd like to begin actually with uh, just getting a sense of how far we are from <clears throat> that sense of interconnectedness and full flourishing um, really right now in the world. And to do that, let's kind of begin with just looking for a moment at our home. And here it is, the earth, yeah, the only uh, source of life that we know of right now in the entire universe. And um, it's been around, life's been on this earth for billions of years, but only in the last really couple of hundred thousand years has one species um, developed, which has had this power to actually change the very um, structure and nature of life on earth. Um, and as humans in just the last couple of hundred years, we've had a massive impact on the planet. And, uh, you know, how has this one species acted in this role, in this incredibly powerful role on the earth? Um, well, as we all know, sadly, um, we've been doing a lousy job of it. Uh, we've been really causing vast ecological destruction across the board. Um, we all know about the existential risk of climate breakdown right now that we're looking at. Um, ecosystems around the world are facing ecological collapse as a result of human activities. Um, since 1970, there's actually been a 68% decline in animal populations around the world. Um, and we're now looking at uh, what scientists are calling the sixth great extinction of species since life began on Earth. Only this one, of course, is human caused. So uh, how, did we, how did we get to this place? Why are we doing this? Um, and uh, that's actually one of the questions that I investigated in that book that Alex was talking about that got published a few years ago called The Patterning Instinct, um, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. And the major uh, learning that came out of that book, that, that crystallized what that book was about, is the simple kind of statement that actually culture shapes values all through human history. And those values are what shape history. And by the same token, our values are what will shape the future. So let's take a brief moment to look at what our values actually are. Well, basically, this is a great sort of icon of what our values look like right now in the world. Like our values are based on separation. And the modern story of separation goes something like this. It says that nature is a machine, that humans are separate from nature, that humans are separate from each other, that human progress arises from the conquest of nature. Um, and the whole earth, it really is just a resource to exploit for human benefit. And ultimately the purpose of life and this is to basically get wealthy and powerful and that's what it's all about. Um, but as I've spent a number of years looking at the underlying assumptions of this modern story of separation and as I describe in this new book that's coming out next month, The Web of Meaning, um, I show that actually, and I'll be showing in this presentation right now, every one of those elements of that modern story of separation is false. And now in, in this new book and in what I'll be talking about today, I look at how um, the findings of modern science, whether in neuroscience, complexity science, evolutionary biology or system sciences, points to the same underlying truth 
that traditional wisdom has been pointing to for millennia in indigenous knowledge and in Taoism, in Buddhism, and basically the truth of our intrinsic interconnectedness. Um, and arising out of that, uh, we can actually see a new story of connectedness that can replace that old story of separation, that we are all interconnected in a web of meaning. So to explore what that actually means, how we're, in we're interconnected and what are the implications of that? I'm going to uh, take a look at each of these big existential questions that human beings all ask at some point in their lives. Like, who am I? Where am I? What am I? How should I live? And ultimately, why am I? And we're going to look at each of these just <clears throat> briefly. Um, and we're going to begin with this first one. Who am I? And in each case, we're going to look at what our mainstream culture tells us, and then a different way to think about how to answer, how to begin answering that question. So when we think about what our mainstream culture tells us <clears throat> when we ask, who am I? Well, basically, most modern ideas about who am I come, come from uh, <clears throat> this classic foundational uh, <clears throat> sort of statement of modern philosophy that Descartes uttered hundreds of years ago, I think, therefore I am. And now what that statement does is it basically gives the sense that human identity itself exists solely through our conceptualizing faculty, through our brains. And therefore animals who don't have that conceptualizing faculty and even our own bodies are just mere machines. They don't really have a true existence. But what modern ethology and biology has come to see really clearly is animals most definitely are not machines. For example, we see elephants can communicate to each other over hundreds of miles through infrasound. They perform ceremonies over dead family members. <clears throat> Dolphins and whales talk to each other in what have been identified as local dialects. They call each other by name and they even gossip about those who are temporarily absent. Um, we see wolves showing deep family commitment and males helping to raise the young until they reach maturity. But this kind of intelligence and sensitivity in nature isn't just um, limited <clears throat> to those kind of advanced mammals um, like the ones we're looking at here. Even plants have been discovered to have this profound networked intelligence. Plants have a distributed intelligence and they've been discovered now to have up to 20 different senses. They have been shown to act intentionally and purposefully. They learn, they have memories, they communicate with each other and, and they even allocate resources as a community. Something that's been identified <clears throat> by um, some biologists in recent findings is the wood wide web of connectedness. And even when we go deep into life itself to the very um, existence of single cells, like so tiny <clears throat> that we can't even see them except through modern microscopes, even single cells have been shown now to display stunning intelligence. Um, and every single cell we have in our bodies has thousands of sensors and proteins. It can send and receive hundreds of signals. It's aware of itself and others. It knows what to do. It cooperates in community with other cells. And these cells make decisions as a group. So this is the deep intelligence in nature that modern science is only just beginning to, un to uncover, to reveal. But thousands of years ago, <clears throat> back in ancient China, the Taoists already had a deep sense of this deep intelligence in nature, even though they didn't have the microscopes and the science that we have right now. And we see this in something like the, just the title of this great Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching, which uh, <clears throat> can be translated as the classic of Tao and De. And if we look <clears throat> at what those words mean, Tao and De, 
Well, many people are familiar with the word Tao, which really means something like way or path. And it is, talks about how the forces of nature manifest in the world. People aren't quite as familiar sometimes with this word de, which refers to the spontaneity in nature, the intrinsic nature of thing, um, which is inherent basically in all living things. And um, what the Taoists saw was that the state of acting with de was um, something that they called wu wei, or we can translate that as effortless action. And they saw all non-human organisms acting naturally in wu wei with the birds, animals, or plants, or whatever. But something happened to humans to make our existence different from that. So what was that? Well, humans, they thought, also had wu wei, the potential for effortless action. But we also, as humans, developed something called yu wei, purposive action. And they talked about it as the kind of faculty in humans that where we would use a fire to dry up a well or force water uphill to irrigate a mountainside. That kind of purpose of human behavior. And from that, they developed a theory of civilization that long ago in the ancient times, the, the, there was a tranquility that belonged to the whole world, a state of perfect unity and people were on terms of equality with all creatures like forming one family. But then when humans developed Yu Wei, that other form of behavior, and then in the words of Zhuangzi, uh, another Taoist scholar, um, until a, a Taoist sage at that time, men began to be separated from one another. Now, here's what's interesting. In modern times, modern neuroscientists have identified where in the human brain um, that new way cognition is mediated. It's in the prefrontal cortex, the front of our brain. And cognitive neuroscientists have begun to recognize that's the part of the brain most highly developed in humans than other animals <clears throat> that allows us to have things like symbolic thought, conceptualizing, planning, and creating abstractions. And when we look back in ancient history, just as the Taoist said, <clears throat> what we now find with cognitive anthropology is the emergence of symbolic thought is what led to things like language, culture, arts, and tool making. So <clears throat> we've now begun to understand what the Taoists understood many millennia ago, that we actually have a dual human consciousness. We have an animate consciousness that's intuitive, fast, emotional, and effortless. A lot like, in fact, pretty much exactly the same as that Wu Wei that the Taoists um, called. We also have the conceptual consciousness that's analytic, slow, rational, and effortful. That's what Descartes thought was only um, the true human identity, ignoring anything else. But that is what we see as the source of Yu Wei. And so what we now understand is that actually um, our consciousness involves both that animate and conceptual, and our human challenge is to integrate both of those systems in harmony. So now we can begin to answer this question, who am I in a different way, recognizing that I am a, a mind-body organism capable of integration. So let's now look at that next question, where am I? And so once again, if we begin with the mainstream view, what we see in our <clears throat> dominant culture is this idea of a split universe, that somehow there's this material world and a, a separate, a totally separate dimension that many people would see as a place of a transcendent spirit, like um, they might call God. And in recent times, we've seen religion and science um, sort of migrating to exist in these two different domains. And the general understanding is religion um, sort of talks about this one domain and science is there to talk about the other domain. And that split universe <clears throat> that we're told we live in leads fundamentally to our unsustainable worldview where it's considered okay to pray to that source of transcendent meaning, even while we ransack nature below. But if we look again, back to China, in fact, about a thousand years ago, 
<clears throat> two, there was another way of thinking about the universe that developed by <clears throat> a group of scholars called the School of the Tao. <clears throat> and they developed in Song Dynasty, China, around a thousand years um, AD. And there, <clears throat> there were three different great traditions in China at the time, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. And these uh, people that we now know um, by the name Neo-Confucianists integrated these three great strands of <clears throat> um, thinking about the universe into one systematic, comprehensive way of making sense of the world. And for the Neo-Confucians, they saw the entire universe consisting of qi, which many of you know that word, um, which we can really translate now in today's language is like matter and or energy. But here critically, they saw that that qi was, um, the print, uh, was connected by what they called li, which we can really define as the principles of connection of all that qi. And when they looked at all the ways in which those connections happen through the universe, the totality of all the li, those principles of connection in the universe was what they understood as the Tao. Now, if we fast forward to modern times, what we see again in recent decades that systems sciences also points to a connected universe. We see this in sciences like complexity science, systems biology, or chaos theory. And what all of these different uh, disciplines show us is that actually everything is connected um, in non-linear ways. And what these sciences show us is that just like the Taoists um, and just like the Neo-Confucians recognize that the interactions between things <clears throat> often tell us more about them than the things themselves. Whether we're looking at starlings flocking in the sky or schools of fish in the ocean or the ripples of sand dunes or <clears throat> even the entire global system of the earth or even the way in which galaxies connect up together. And um, what we see is that the interactions often tell us more than the things themselves. And when modern scientists study these interactions, they see one particularly important um, quality about these interactions that often these universal patterns in nature have fractal patterning. Fractals are patterns that repeat themselves at different scales. They indicate self-organized activity. And we see them everywhere in the natural world. We see them in coastlines, the patterning of leaves, in lightning, in the way that our lungs uh, are structured, and even the neurons in our brain. Every one of these follow fractal patterns. And as scientists look at the entire Earth system, they've begun to recognize that nature itself is really a fractally connected system where every cell is um, fractally uh, works according to the same principles as the organism of which it's part, which is fractally connected to the species. And every species is ultimately fractally connected to an ecosystem, which is then connected <clears throat> fractally to the living earth. So when we look at the universe in this way, we can begin to recognize that as we start to think about where I am, we can think of ourselves as really part of a fractally connected, self-organized universe, which allows us now to start thinking about what am I? And if we go back again to um, something that one of the great sages of that Song Dynasty in China, Chu Shi, said about a thousand years ago, this great statement, he said, if one wishes to know the reality of Tao, one must seek it in one's own nature. Now, if we look to modern, uh, <clears throat> this sort of modern mainstream way of making sense of our own nature, well, we need look no further than Richard Dawkins, who has been incredibly successful in the last few decades of spreading um, this, <clears throat> this kind of idea of what is known as the selfish gene which has now become uh, very widely accepted in mainstream thought as understanding who we are and how nature works. And 
he argues that, well, we and all other animals are machines created by our genes in a highly competitive world. And as a result, a predominant quality to be expected in a successful gene is ruthless selfishness. And so um, the argument is that we're dominated by these genes, which are the fundamental unit of evolution. It dictates everything about the organism and it's inherently selfish and competitive. But once again, what modern um, findings in evolutionary biology and systems biology um, has shown is that every one of these statements that Dawkins put out there that are accepted as true in mainstream thinking are actually false. It turns out that genes, are, rather than dominating what happens, they're part of an iterative process with the cell. There's actually a vibrant, dynamic, circular flow of interactivity between the gene and the cell. And <clears throat> biologists now um, sh um, show that we can think of the genotype more like an artist's palette. It's really, it offers a repertoire of the capabilities that the cell can select based on its particular needs as determined by the environment. And to get an idea of this, um, this is a, a kind of mind blowing example of what that means. Think for a moment of a grasshopper. We kind of know them as gentle, solitary creatures munching, munching away on a leaf. So the grasshopper actually has exactly the same DNA, the same genes as locusts, those aggressive swarms that can wipe out entire regions of their food that act in totally different ways. Exactly the same organism, the same DNA, but um, at certain points, that grasshopper um, will actually tell its genes, tell its DNA to actually express genes in a different way and turn itself into a locust along with millions and millions of others. So that gives you a sense of what we understand now by, in, in biology. And it's not just a matter of uh, refuting that idea of selfish, uh, of, of like the gene dictating things, but the selfishness of genes actually turns out to be another myth. In fact, um, the life itself has evolved over billions of years um, as a result of increases in cooperation. If you look back over billions of years, going from single cells to complex cells, multicellular life, animals, mammals, every one of those big steps in evolution has come around not through increases in selfishness of their genes, but through cooperation, through organisms learning how to cooperate better with each other. So we recognize now that life itself has evolved through cooperation. Um, in the words of <coughs> systems biologist Lynn Margulis, life did not take over the world by combat, but by networking. And when we look at any abundance of an ecosystem, we recognize that what's driven by it is a sense of mutually beneficial symbiosis, like a harmonic dance of life, where plants photosynthesize and provide nourishment, insects pollinate those plants, animals transport the seeds, they fertilize the soil, the fungus regenerates that, and, and actually through mycorrhizal networks helps to transport the uh, different plants, nutrients around, <clears throat> around the ecosystem. That's actually what life is, um, is, it is in its essence. And organisms themselves have been recognized now biologists to be self-organized, fractal, dynamic patterns. In the words of um, the great uh, system biologist Carl Woese, we need to see organisms as resilient patterns in a turbulent flow. And he's saying it's become clear that um, to really understand living systems in a deep sense, we need to see them not like machines, but as stable, complex, dynamic organization. So as a result of that, now when we think about what am I, <clears throat> rather than basically machines dominated by selfish genes, we can begin to recognize ourselves as a resilient pattern of self-organized cooperation. Which leads to this next question. Well, how should I then live as a result of all this? So if we first begin, again, looking what the dominant culture tells us, it tells us that humans are intrinsically selfish 
and greedy. And <clears throat> in fact, that selfish behavior by individuals is in the best interest of everyone. That's how capitalism and neoliberalism works. That famous quote from Gordon Gekko um, from that movie Wall Street decades ago, greed is good, is basically the underlying kind of foundation of our modern global economic system. And even those who don't believe in that system, and to his credit, Richard Dawkins is one of those, um, believes that we have to overcome our selfish genes in order to get beyond that. So he talks about how let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. We need to understand what those selfish genes are up to so we can try to upset their designs. But again, what cognitive anthropology and evolutionary biology now shows us is that the opposite is true. Humans actually evolved to be cooperative that as we diverged from other primates millions of years ago, those early pre-humans were vulnerable to predators, those who learned to collaborate were the most successful. And over millions of years, our identity expanded from self and kin to include the entire group, that it's actually the human ability to cooperate with each other, even those who are not kin, and that differentiates us from other primates. Now, indigenous cultures around the world have understood this for millennia. In Africa, one of the most important concepts that people live by is the sense of Ubuntu, I am because you are. And this is a result of what evolved in humans as moral emotions. We've actually developed a sense of an, an intuitive gut sense of acting for the community. So that's why we have feelings like compassion, guilt, shame, gratitude, and embarrassment. We don't just act morally because we think we should. We don't try to overcome our selfish genes, but we do so because it feels right. And that's why <clears throat> we see this, um, this concept in ind indigenous cultures of existing as a result of other people. Or and we see in North America, the Lakota talk about this concept of mitakuye oyasin, we are all related. But when they're talking about being all related, they're not just talking about all humans related to each other, but all our relations, including all other animals and plants and the entire living earth. So we begin to recognize that flourishing is based on our intrinsic connectedness. It's based on connectedness within ourselves, within all of our cells in our body, with others, and with the natural world, and with the entire living earth. And uh, when we look at how that flourishing unfolds, just like the way that life itself is fractal, we see that human flourishing is fractal, that every a human mind-body organism is a fractal element within a much larger community. And every community is a fractal element within the much larger community of the entire living earth. Now, the great humanitarian Albert Schweitzer recognized all this in the 20th century. And he offered an alternative life-based value system uh, based on this idea of recognizing that I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And as a result of that, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. That is the beginning and foundation of morality. And from that understanding, we can begin to look at this question of how should I live from a very different point of view than what our mainstream culture tells us, that actually I should live in reverence and care for all life. Which leads us to this final question of why am I? And again, if we look to what modern, um, the modern sort of mainstream thinking tells us, it tells us that there is no reason why, <clears throat> that we live in a pointless universe. Um, Nobel winning laureate Steven Weinberg says it really powerfully when he says, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. But actually, when we look at the universe from this 
recognition of deep interconnectedness, we can see meaning itself arising as a function of connectedness. That as the number of connections increases in all the different systems around us, they lead to phase transitions and the emergence of new meaning within those systems. And we see that all around us when words connect um, in a complex enough way, language emerges. When organisms connect, an ecosystem emerges. When neurons connect, consciousness emerges. And many of us have had that profound experience at some point in our life where we feel this sense of deep connectivity with the entire universe all around us. Oftentimes for people that'll be a peak experience. But what modern science now shows us is that that is not some experience that's separate from the sort of material understanding of the world is actually a deep recognition of the true intrinsic reality of the connectedness of the universe. And so that recognition has profound implications. It means that everything you do in your life creates these Lee ripples of connectedness which affect everything else in the universe, leading to this profound principle of the ultimate connectivity of everything in the cosmos. That we exist in a notion of Lee and those Lee ripples exist within each of us. And the choices we make, the personal choices and actions we take, choices to participate in regenerative community, choices to engage in the broader political process, all of these are the choices and actions we take that ultimately weave the web of meaning of which we're intrinsically part. So when we see this, we can begin to answer this ultimate question, why am I? In this way to see, well, maybe I am here to weave my part in the web of meaning. And perhaps if enough of us get to this point of realization and work together to do that, then we can shift that mainstream uh, worldview of destructiveness and together regenerate our beautiful, fragile earth. And um, in this new book, The Web of Meaning, I describe all of these, these elements in more detail. This just shows you the, the, the covers of the book. This is the one that's coming out in the UK next month. And um, there'll be another one, uh, um, same book, different cover coming out in the US in July. And so just as I leave this presentation right now and open to discussion, I just want to leave for each of you to consider for yourself as we go, um, as after we leave this hour, just in your own lives, to ask yourself, where are the opportunities in my own life to weave my part in the web of meaning? So thanks very much.